tradition of the theme of praise. The topic or title for our second reflection is The Relational Intention Eclipses the Cost. Again, continuing to reflect on sacrifice, uh, the sacrifices of Christian life, and particularly the sacrifice of repentance that we're all engaging in now. In my book, Welcoming Gifts, I describe how the modern idea of sacrifice has been distorted. Sacrifice is now understood as being defined by loss, suffering, and violence. So if we think of the paradigmatic sacrifice of the soldier for his country, it refers to his death on the battlefield, uh, an act of violence, act of suffering, loss of life on his part. We also might speak of parents sacrificing for their children. And when we say that, we generally mean that they are giving up something for their children's betterment. It's giving something up for a higher cause. This is generally how we understand the word sacrifice today. In the Bible, the meaning of sacrifice is not found in these negative connotations. Instead, the Bible describes sacrifice in terms of food, aroma, and gifts. And these are all common everyday means of building relationships with people, making friends with people. The ritual offerings of the Old Testament and of other ancient cultures as well translate these familiar gestures of friendship in, into symbolic ways of expressing invitation, welcome, and commitment to God. So these <clears throat> means of building friendships on the horizontal plane, sacrifice translates to the the vertical dimension. The fathers, interestingly, say that this impulse of sacrifice is planted in our human nature from the beginning. Um, And we can see in that the providence of God providing some accessibility for us to relationship with him. He is, of course, beyond all human and earthly experiences, but he provides us these symbolic means of building relationship with him, um, accepting the gestures even though the acts themselves are incommensurate with him. So first, sacrifice as food. Biblical sacrifices of animals, grains, oil, and wine, were the offering of a meal to God. In fact, generally, these would be combined together, paired with one another. So a meat and a starch would be offered on the altar and, uh, and wine would be poured out next to the altar, all as part of the same act, presenting a full meal to God. Uh, Oftentimes, the worshipers would join in themselves in this feast. Especially in Middle Eastern culture, but I would say universally, food hospitality is an essential means of showing others that they are welcome in our midst. So when we have a guest come, we honor them by putting out a fine spread of food. Also, sharing a meal is a means of building relationships from holiday gatherings, which are essential to, you know, family togetherness, and even uh, family dinners together, whether it's daily or on a special day of the week, for example, Sunday. Even in commerce, business lunches are used to foster relationships. And on the level of government, There are state dinners where leaders show welcome to other leaders. So we can see that on all levels of human society, sharing a meal is a way of building relationships. Now, God does not need to eat. Of course, we all know that. The gesture, 
like the substance of the gesture is incommensurate to who God is and what God is. But the gesture and symbolism of food hospitality provide a way for, provided a way for ancient people to demonstrate their desire to have God in their lives. Uh, it was a way of, of, of showing that intention toward him. Scripture also speaks of sacrifice as uh, aroma, producing an aroma for God, a welcoming aroma. Um, sacrifices that are acceptable to God are described in Leviticus and elsewhere as a pleasant aroma for the Lord. And this uh, combines both the aroma of cooking um, as well as the fragrance of incense. You know, we all have had that experience of walking into a home and there's a, this delicious scent that wafts out and it sort of invites us in, it pulls us in. And even <clears throat> on, our, on our persons, on our bodies, we use scent as a way of attracting attention, making people feel comfortable around us um, with perfume and cologne. So the offerings of aroma to God through the burning of sacrifices as well as the uh, burning of incense is a way of showing God that he's welcome in our life, of attracting his attention, of showing our desire to have him in our lives. And finally, gift. This word gift, especially in the Septuagint, is uh, the technical term for the Old Testament sacrifices, gifts. Um, even today, gift giving is a common part of relationships, uh, of, of beginning relationships, of perpetuating relationships. Think of the engagement ring by which uh, a man proposes to his intended and he offers her this ring as, as an offering of relationship. And if she receives that gift, if she takes it, then she is committing herself to that relationship. It's the same kind of dynamic. We also you know, have Christmas gift exchange, birthday gifts, even gifts exchanged by heads of state when they come to, to meet each other, you know, not uh, really <clears throat> financially valuable gifts, but symbolic gifts. The Canadian prime minister might come and offer a bottle of uh, maple syrup to the American president as a way of offering the, the friendship of the Canadian people to our leader. In the ancient world, gifts were a much more common and expected part of building relationships. Anthropologists call this ceremonial giving or friend-making gifts. It involved something, it involves giving something that comes from oneself, represents oneself, and stands as a sign of one's commitment to the other person. Something that comes from oneself is desirable to the other person, I didn't mention that, and represents oneself in commitment to the other person. So when the gift is given, this symbolic meaningful gift, it represents giving oneself to the other person. This was a common feature of all relationships in the ancient world, really, all kinds of relationships. The qualities of the gift in this context were fundamental to its meaning. We can think of this maybe in, in some modern cases as well. A, a jewel of great beauty is given to one's desired bride as a as a gesture of one's sense of her beauty. Uh, chocolates are given to a sweetheart, maybe on one hand to represent uh, one's appreciation of her sweetness, on the other hand, maybe as a gesture of, of offering one's sweetness to her. And then think of between child and parents, you know, children uh, often hand make gifts which are really not materially valuable but because uh, the card has been drawn with the crown by the, uh, the, by the child, um, it represents 
uh, personal commitment and personal love towards the recipient. In this vein, biblical sacrifices were gifts that symbolized the worshiper's gift of himself to God. And the physical qualities of the animal represented the spiritual qualities that he or she was promising to show toward God by making that gift. Now let's return to that fraught juxtaposition of the nest and the altar that we uh, recognized and meditated on this morning. How do we reconcile these inspiring and meaningful symbols, the food, aroma, and gift, with the ritual of killing and dismembering an animal and then putting it in the fire, this disturbing procedure that we struggle to comprehend. At its most basic level, the answer is simple. This is virtually the same procedure that must lead up to dinner for most of us, at least until a little over a week ago. If you want meat on your plate, something like this must happen. The sacrificial ritual of, uh, of birds is not violent any more than the butchering and cooking of a chicken. Just as the turtle dove's neck must be wrung, its head must be removed, its blood drained out, its carcass split open, all of these things happen to the chicken before it ends up in the supermarket. A large part of the discomfort or even revulsion we might feel at the idea of bloody sacrifice arises from our modern distance from the realities of meat production. However, we should not be too quick to completely dismiss the discomfort of this act. Here's maybe a little bit of a corrective to my book, Welcoming Gifts. In, in highlighting the essential meaning of these acts, I maybe downplayed the the uh, um, at least apparent violence or the discomfort that, that might be involved. The farmer probably has some sense of sorrow or at least discomfort at the necessity of the slaughter. He has cared for this animal over long years. It's not his pet per se, but he has some relationship to it, some connection, some personal investment. As the Lord says, the good shepherd calls his sheep and they know his name. So when the farmer approaches the, the needed slaughter for the sake of the meal, he might feel some, I don't know, in the back of his mind, some twinge of sorrow or, or regret, some discomfort with this act. And certainly the farmer is not sadistically gleeful in the slaughter. The violence of the act does not motivate him. Instead, we should think of him as purposeful and pragmatic. He knows that food must be put on the table and is therefore willing to do what needs to be done. Moreover, if at the time of the slaughter there is in his mind some joyful anticipation of a good meal, this is not in conflict with the discomfort that he has. It shouldn't be seen as some kind of sadism, some kind of delight in violence itself. It is possible in a sound mind for the discomfort of the slaughter to coexist with the joyful anticipation of the result the joyfulness, we could say, of the purpose. And in fact, that joyful purpose can even eclipse the discomfort or sorrow. Imagine the father in the story of the prodigal son. <clears throat> he orders that the fatted calf be killed. This fatted calf that's been prepared over long years, whom he has some kind of personal investment in. Maybe some part of him would tend to, to regret the loss of this animal's life. And yet the joyful purpose of celebrating his son's return can eclipse that. And in asking for the fatted calf to be killed, 
He might have a joyfulness which has no, no celebration of the violence in it. Really, all the relational metaphors of sacrifice, food, aroma, and gift, involve some form of discomfort or even hardship. To serve a meal requires planning, expense, and labor. The same is true of meaningful gift giving, something more than just sort of like stopping by CVS and buying a a gift card. And even trying to smell good requires some serious effort and expense. These difficulties are seen as necessary, but they are merely means to an end. They are not the end or the the point or the purpose of the action. The purpose, the relational purpose, motivates the effort and even eclipses the hardship. The epistle to the Hebrews describes our Lord as similarly prioritizing purpose over hardship in his approach to the cross. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Who of us, when facing the prospect of the cross with the clarity of knowledge that the Lord had, would see it as joy, would approach it with joy, who would be motivated by joy? Our Lord gives us this great example. It's not a sort of masochistic delight in suffering, certainly such a thing would be far from the Lord. Rather, it is a joyful anticipation of reconciling God and humankind within himself. This relational purpose gave him joy that eclipsed the sufferings that were coming. It eclipsed the pain and humiliation, the great pain and humiliation of the cross for him. And notice that in this passage, the author of the epistle is using the Lord's example to inspire us to set aside the, uh, our fears of trials and of the difficulties and hardships of repentance for the sake of the joy of reconciling with God, of running to meet him, arriving at the pioneer and perfecter of our faith and being welcomed by him. In a passage from the Gospel of John, the Lord himself uses this kind of joyful anticipation to inspire his disciples to persevere through the trials that they would endure at his passion. John 16, 21 through 22, just before the Passion, he tells his disciples, when a woman is in travail, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she is delivered of the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a child is born into the world. So you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. So he doesn't, he doesn't deny the difficulty and the, the discomfort, the hardship that will come to them, the trials they will face on his account. But he, what he offers them is the joy of a purpose that eclipses all of those difficulties. <clears throat> Suffering does not make something a sacrifice. We need to be clear about that. Our modern misconception um, 
leads us really into some uh, theological uh, problems, not to, not to say uh, psychological problems. The equation of suffering and sacrifice is a modern distortion of this biblical concept. Instead, it is the relational intention of the offering that makes it a sacrifice. The negative elements do not make the sacrifice meaningful. They are merely pragmatic, necessary, or at best, they are a background against which the relational significance shines all the brighter. So as we approach the sacrifices of Christian life, especially repentance, asceticism, prayer, almsgiving, we must maintain foremost in our minds that intention of reaching out to God, attracting his attention, welcoming him into our lives, showing him our commitment to becoming good friends toward him. In fact, we might say that if you feel like you are suffering in these disciplines, these Christian practices, that this actually undermines the genuine sacrificial nature of the act. Sometimes because of this modern distortion, we feel like for it to be a sacrifice, it needs to hurt. This is not a biblical way of thinking. This is a modern way of thinking. In order for it to be a sacrifice, it needs to involve reaching out and seeking to make friends with God. When you instead prioritize the suffering as giving meaning to these sacrifices, the focus turns toward yourself, and it is no longer a friend-making gift, but some kind of personal accomplishment, some act of spiritual heroism. For this reason, We ought not to focus on finding harder and harder disciplines to undertake. Instead, we must focus on seeking God with abandon. And if that's our focus, we'll actually find that we are engaging in harder and harder efforts. Because our relationship with him eclipses all of the hardships and sufferings that we're facing. We must seek him with abandon to the point of forgetting the difficulty that this pursuit entails. That's all I have for today. Tomorrow we'll focus on the relational purpose and the hardships of sacrificial repentance and how they fit together.